As you can see in my title, uh, Vienna versus Chicago uh, on monetary issues, my original title uh, that, that sort of was parallel to an earlier talk I gave uh, was uh, Hayek and Friedman Head-to-Head. Uh, -head. And it occurs to me that you've all seen another lecture earlier in the week called Friedman and Mises on Method uh, by Roderick Long. I didn't hear that lecture myself, but uh, I heard it had sort of a philosophical bent to it. Is that right? Uh, so here you'll get something a little different. Uh, it, I, I might edge off in the direction of uh, philosophy, but uh, not too far. Okay, I'm a macroeconomist. Uh, so it's mostly economics. Um, okay, Hayek and Friedman head-to-head, -head, but it turns out that uh, Keynes is in the mix too. Uh, you just have to live with it, that if you're going to talk about macroeconomics, uh, Keynes is in the picture, all right? But uh, Keynes will help us understand uh, the basic differences uh, between Friedman and Hayek, uh, as you'll see. So what I want to do for starters uh, is look at Keynes, Friedman, and Hayek uh, in a, a very summary perspective that I hope will help, and it will sort of focus on uh, what's to come. And it goes like this. There he is. Keynes. Uh, and so <clears throat> Keynes is often accused of having a high level of aggregation. Hayek accuses him of that, and that's certainly true. So theorizing at a high level of aggregation, Keynes argued that market economies perform perversely, especially the market mechanisms that are supposed to bring saving and, in and investment into balance with one another. He threw out the loanable funds market. He didn't think it worked the way that his classical colleagues thought it did. So seeing unemployment and resource idleness as the norm, he called for counter-cyclical fiscal and monetary policies and ultimately for a comprehensive socialization of investment. That quoted phrase down there is lifted from the Swan Song chapter, the chapter 24 of uh, Keynes's general theory. Interpreters of Keynes over the years uh, have spent a lot, spilled a lot of ink trying to figure out just what did Keynes mean by a comprehensive socialization of investment, okay? I think I know, and I don't have to write an article about it. <laughs> I, think I, I think he meant what he said. Okay, but now the important thing here is to get the contrast. There's Friedman, and what we have to note is uh, he has a still higher level of aggregation. Uh, so Friedman's monetarism was based on a still higher level of aggregation. The equation of exchange, MV equal PQ, you'll see that crop up uh, in the exposition uh, this morning, made an all-inclusive, made use of an all-inclusive output variable Q. Q is economic output. Economic output of consumer goods, economic output of producer goods. They're just lumped together and called Q. So that little construction, uh, sort of upping the level of aggregation, just put into eclipse the issues of the allocation of resources between consumption and investment for the future. Okay, so that issue is off the table uh, with Friedman. Now, he thought it was well and good to put it off the table because he didn't think there was anything wrong with the market that performed that allocation. In other words, loanable funds theory works fine. Thank you very much, but we're macroeconomists. We don't deal with allocation of resources within the Q aggregate. We deal with the whole Q aggregate, okay? So seeing no problems emerging from the market itself, Friedman shifted the focus, really. He focused on the relationship between government-controlled money supply and the overall price level. And boy, he took that issue a long way. And uh, that's what uh, the Austrians give uh, Friedman plenty of credit for, for reviving uh, the notion of that relationship between money and the price level. Uh, there's a, the symbols in the equation of exchange, you can see what they are, we'll come back to that later. And so now if we go to uh, Hayek, uh, capital-based macroeconomics, you should have said, or could have said Austrian macroeconomics, is distinguished by its propitious Propitious disaggregation. I'll make my Auburn sophomores look up the word propitious. 
means just well suited, sort of the right level, uh, which brings into view both the problem of intertemporal resource allocation and the potential for a market solution, the potential for a market solution. And that's why in my earlier lecture, I had part of it on sustainable growth and part on unsustainable, unsustainable growth. You get the potential for a market solution, but you don't necessarily get that solution if government's involved and is rigging interest rates. So F.A. Hayek showed that a coordination of saving and investment decisions could be achieved by market government governed huh, movements in the interest rate. He also recognized that this aspect of the market economy is especially vulnerable to the manipulation of interest rates by the central bank. All right, so he's got the lowest level of aggregation uh, of the three and still call it macroeconomics but he's brought into view this critical relationship and shows how it can be uh, perverted by uh, policy. Okay, now I want to look at contrasting methods. And we'll see if I sound like Roderick Long. I don't think so. I think I can make it through a discussion of methods without bringing in a whole lot of uh, philosophy. Um, and here's where I start with John Maynard Keynes. And uh, I'm drawing here from a book by Alan Meltzer where he's summing up how Keynes went about his business. How did Keynes do macroeconomics? Anyway, so here's what Meltzer says. He says, Keynes was the type of theorist who developed his theory after he developed a sense of relative magnitudes and of the size and frequency of change in each of these magnitudes. So, he just looks out the window or looks at uh, the economy as a whole and see what's moving around a lot. Uh, and then those are his variables. And if something isn't moving around a lot, well, it gets dropped out of the picture. And something said about it in chapter four, which is his throat clearing remarks about what he's not looking at. Okay, It's the things that aren't moving around a lot. All right. So he concentrated on those magnitudes that change most, often assuming the others remain fixed for the relevant period. That's why he had that fixed structure of production, for instance. He didn't see that moving around a lot, okay? But he did see uh, the economy caving into depression. So total output was changing a lot. Investment was changing a lot. That's from Alan Meltzer's book on uh, Keynes' Monetary Theory, A Different Interpretation, 1988. Very good book on Keynes, by the way. Now, what did Milton Friedman say? Well, he really didn't have his own judgment. He just accepted Keynes. So he says, I believe that Keynes' theory is right, is the right kind of theory, in its simplicity, its concentration on a few key magnitudes, and its potential fruitfulness, all right? That's from uh, Friedman, an interview with him uh, in 86. Uh, a more well-quoted statement of Friedman's is that we're all Keynesians now. He, he said that in a Time Magazine interview and eventually complained that he was being quoted out of context. And he was to the extent that people took him to mean that we want discretionary uh, tax policy and discretionary spending policy in order to stabilize the economy. No, 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 he didn't mean that. In fact, if you read the interview carefully, you see he didn't mean that, and you see what he did mean, and here's what he says. We all use the Keynesian language and apparatus, all right? Well, what is a Keynesian language and apparatus? It's C plus I plus G, it's the Keynesian cross, it's ISLM analysis. In fact, when he set out back in, the, in about 1970, he set out the differences between monetarism and Keynesianism. He set it out in terms of the ISLM analysis. So he argued within the context of Keynesian economics, uh, differing with Keynes only in terms of stability properties of investment demand or money demand, and in terms of the elasticities of the different curves. So we all use the Keynesian language and apparatus. Now that's a little bit too overreaching. We all, who's we all? Well, Keynesians and monetarists, that's we all. Doesn't include the Austrians, they have a different apparatus. 
Okay. Uh, and uh, so here we get a distinction between the Austrians on the one hand and Keynes and Friedman on the other. It's quoted in Time magazine. Now, here's what Hayek says to pair off to sort of in contrast with that. He says the role of the economist, Hayek points out in Pure Theory of Capital, is precisely to identify the features of the market process that are hidden from the untrained eye. That, that last phrase is the one that's a direct quote, hidden from the untrained eye, all right? Any schmuck can look at an economy and tell that it's gone into the toilet, okay? You can see GDP falling by a third between 29 and 33, okay? Uh, a, a local news reporter can report that, right? But the job of the economist is to look for features of the econ economy before that happened and see how the stage was set for that kind of a collapse in the economy, all right? Does it go on here? So for Hayek, the cause and effect relationship between central bank policy during the boom and the subsequent economic downturn have a first order claim on our attention despite the more salient co-movements in, in macroeconomic magnitudes that characterize a, a post-crisis spiraling of the economy into deep depression. Excuse me for my stumbling over that quote. but uh, So he can say it's cause and effect that causes to pick out this or that uh, to focus on. And it's not uh, the co-movements. One of the things you hear in, in, uh, among modern economists is lots of discussion about co-movements. Unless you can show there are co-movements here or co-movements there, uh, you really just haven't shown much of anything. Okay. This is what Hayek said uh, when he accepted his uh, Nobel Prize uh, in uh, 74, and he's uh, criticizing, especially the monetarists, but econometricians generally, macroeconometricians, there may well exist better scientific evidence, that is empirically demonstrated regularities among key macroeconomic magnitudes, for a false theory which will be accepted because it is more scientific. He puts that in quotes because economist means scientific. By scientific, you've got data and you can put an equation, you can test it and so on more scientific than for a valid explanation, which is rejected because there's no significant quantitative evidence for it, at least not in the eyes of uh, the econometricians. So this, this is another way of just reinforcing this difference between um, Friedman uh, and Hayek. Okay, now this is something I want to get across uh, in a way that you won't forget. We'll see if, if it works. Uh, but typically with any two theorists that are at issue with one another about the whole field, uh, they tend to be asking different questions. They have different focuses. They're not even raising the same questions and, and of course then not giving the same kinds of answers. Uh, and that's what we find with Friedman uh, and Hayek. Uh, and let's see how that works. Again, I'll bring Keynes into the picture. Keynes doesn't really have an economic explanation of why the crash occurs. He blames it on psychology, all right? So he attributes the downturn to psychological factors affecting the investment community, okay? These are not psychological factors that compound a bad situation. These are psychological factors that end the good situation, uh, that the, the investors become introspective and they, and they see the economy as a house of cards and they get cold feet and they pull back and sure enough the economy crashes. Okay, so his main focus is really not on that. How long can you focus on that? His main focus is the dynamics of the subsequent spiraling downwards. That's where the Keynesian multiplier comes in and on policies aimed at reversing the spiral's direction. That's where the stimulus packages come in. So that's sort of you know, sophomore level, uh, basic Keynesian fiscal mon or fiscal uh, spending and tax policy and so on. Let's look at Friedman. And this is something that, that people seem not to be aware of until you just show them the evidence here. Uh, 
Friedman is dismissive of the whole issue of the cause of the downturn, <clears throat> referring to it as, and I've become sensitive to these adjectives, it's an ordinary, run-of-the-mill, routine, garden-variety recession. I don't think a macroeconomist should be talking in those terms. The macroeconomist should be explaining why you had a recession at all, uh, rather than simply call it garden-variety, routine, ordinary, and so on. Okay? So to, to use those kinds of terms is to be dismissive of the issue. We don't need to explain it was just an ordinary recession. All right. The real question, though, uh, is why the downturn was so dramatic. So his focus is on policy blunders, it turns out a uh, collapse of the money supply, that occurred on the heels of the downturn, it didn't, uh, and on the correlation between the decrease in the money supply and the fall in real GDP. So, see, we're back to Keynes. He looked at the things that changed the most. You had the money supply falling dramatically, you had GDP falling dramatically, those are co-movements, co and you can get the numbers and you can show that one's related to the other. Uh, and then you're scientific, and now you've explained depressions, okay? But what you haven't explained is how did the boom turn into a bust in the first place? Which is what Hayek was interested in, of course. I'm uh, anticipating that. Friedrich Hayek focuses on the policy-infected aspects of the boom. He's the one that's looking at the 20s, not the 30s. And there are implications of the boom's sustainability. Recovery from the subsequent bust takes time, but the particular dimensions of the depression, its length and depth, are to be explained largely in terms of the policy perversities in each of the particular cyclical episodes. Okay? It depends on what the government does to try to fix the problem. If they didn't do anything, uh, like in the case of the 1921 downturn, uh, you get recovery in... 18 months or so. If they do a whole lot, like with Roosevelt or with Obama, you don't get recovery, okay? <laughs> you get the economy tank. But you have to deal with Roosevelt and Obama to find out uh, why the depression is as bad uh, as it is, okay? But here, I, I'm, the main thing I want to show you is that Friedman and Hayek are focusing on different questions. Uh, I'll come back to that after I show you a little bit about Friedman's monetarism. And forgive me if you've already been through this in the classroom, but uh, we can set it up in a way that might help. <coughs> MV equal PQs. That M's the money supply. V is its rate of circulation through the economy. Uh, typically uh, taken to be about eight right now, eight or nine. If you're looking at the number of times each dollar on average gets paid out as income. So the amount of money there is times the rate it gets paid out as income, that's total income, which gets spent one way or another on output, either investment goods or consumer goods, at some price level, call it P. Okay, so MV equal PQ, that's really an accounting identity. It's always true, uh, as Friedman clearly recognized. But it says with nearly constant velocity of money, actually velocity while Friedman was writing, had a slight upward trend, which he was aware of, but uh, for simplicity, we'll have a constant velocity. And output growing slowly, uh, the price level moves with the money supply. So if we could ignore the rate of growth of the real economy, or if it's so small, we'll take it into account, but it still doesn't affect much. That price level moves with the money supply. There are the two cove movements, okay? You can, uh, there's the velocity is constant, there's quantity going up a little bit. Uh, money supply goes up a lot. If so, then prices will go up, up about that much, taking away the increase in the, on the quantity variable. Okay, uh, And that's pretty much it, except for a, a, a timing consideration. It's always been the Achilles heel. Uh, that's not the right, the, the soft underbelly of monetarism. Because this relationship that increasing the money supply causes an increase in the price level works with a long lag. Friedman always says a long and variable lag, sometimes longer than other times, but long uh, as much as 18 to 30 months. 
one of uh, Friedman's last articles was pondering anew, why would the lag be that long? He doesn't, he doesn't have an explanation that satisfies even uh, himself, okay? So uh, that's the monitor story there. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That's probably the most famous quote uh, from Friedman in a 1968 publication. And it's not that no one knew that before Keynes, or before Friedman said it. Mises certainly did. If you read Mises' writing, he understood full well uh, that inflation was caused by an increase in the money supply. The equation of exchange is probably one of the oldest equations in all of economics. But what Friedman gets credit for is reviving it in the 1950s and beating Keynes over the head with it, okay? Uh, and for that, <laughs> we're grateful. <laughs> so Friedman's monetary rule is increase the money supply at a slow and steady rate to achieve long-run price stability. So, okay, if you've got some growth in the economy, then increase the money supply about that rate, and you have price stability as well. He took price stability just as a, a sign of macroeconomic health, and he says that's a, there's a long tradition of that judgment, but he doesn't actually defend it. In fact, when he gets theoretical about it, uh, when he writes the optimum quantity of money, uh, he has a expansion of the money supply that actually gives you a slight deflation. But uh, for practical purposes, uh, keep the price level constant. Uh, that's his monetary rule. He'll say uh, increase the money supply maybe 2%, 3%, maybe a little more if the velocity of money uh, changes in ways that would require that. And uh, some monetarists think that that's not quite precise enough. Gee, we shouldn't be able to pin down how much to increase the money supply. And the suggestion I like comes from uh, Richard Timberlake uh, at University of Georgia, because he, he wants that precision. So he says the money supply should be increased at 3.65% each year, uh, except for leap years, it'd be 3.66. Okay, so if you want precision, there it is. Okay. But here now, this is my Austrian question, but what happens within the Q aggregate as a result of the monetary injection? So you got your increase the money supply with an eye to keeping price levels stable, but the money supply comes through the loan market and affects interest rates. You remember that story, there it is. Uh, if you increase the supply of money, it drives a wedge between saving and investment, and even though it's only keeping the price level constant, it's not increasing it, you don't get price level inflation, uh, it causes problems. Uh, and in fact, that's the story of the 1920s. You got very little in the way of price level inflation, but you've got loose money in the sense of pumping money through credit markets, distorting interest rates, and triggering a boom that couldn't be uh, sustained. Friedman, though, declares the 1920s as the golden years of the Federal Reserve. In his monetary history, the chapter on the 1920s is the high tide of the Federal Reserve. Okay? The high tide. Uh, and in other places, he says golden years of the Federal Reserve. He ignores interest rates during the 20s because they didn't change much. Okay? They didn't change much. Uh, and so, that is, they didn't pass the Keynes criteria. So, Friedman is an econometrician. He's an empiricist. He's, he bows before the data. That's the way the Chicago economists like to explain their humility. You know, they're humble people. We bow, we bow before the data. Uh, and the data show that the interest rate didn't change during the 20s, so it didn't make it into their equations. And you've taken econometrics. You know how it works. Some of you have. Uh, if, you, if you think that there's an independent variable that's important, and then notice that it doesn't change, it's not going to explain anything in your economy to the dependent variable. Isn't that right? Dependent variables function of independent variables. Then you put in the data and that, that particular independent variable didn't change. Well, it's not going to explain any change in the dependent variable. So what do you do? You throw it out. You don't need it. And Keynes said, whoop. And Keynes said, you can't. I'm glad I didn't knock. Uh, Keynes said, 
you ought to throw it out. It doesn't change. We look at what changes first. So, and then I ask the burning question, uh, taking my cue from Hayek, but what if they should have changed? What if interest rates should have changed, but weren't allowed to? Okay, more about that uh, in just a, on the next slide. Also, is it true that it takes a big cause to explain a big effect? This is why Robert Lucas dismissed the Austrian theory. He says, you, you really don't get big enough changes in the interest rate. Uh, to account for a horrendous depression, as if the change is supposed to explain the depth and the length of the Great Depression. Uh, how big a change do you need to get? It could be a small change causes a big effect. Sometimes a big change causes a big effect. And what comes to mind here is uh, Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii. Big effect from a big change, okay? But how about, for instance, a careless smoker and a forest fire, that's a little change and a big effect. Can you imagine somebody arguing that this smoker couldn't have caused that forest fire? Look, look how small that cigarette was. <laughs> it's just too small to have caused all that, all right? Okay. Now, so why, just why was, the interest, was it that the interest rate didn't change much during the 20s? Well, it's fairly easy. Here's where, here's where Hayek is looking for forces that are hidden from the untrained eye. That if we do sort of a full-bodied history, full-bodied economic history of the 1920s, we see lots of innovations. Uh, we see uh, lots of technical advancements. Uh, and therefore, we see entrepreneurs increasing their demand for loanable funds to take advantage uh, of those opportunities. Uh, Mises would call this the entrepreneurial component of the gross interest rate, right? Be a heavy demand for loanable funds. And, and they were borrowing. They're borrowing a lot of funds and undertaking these investments. But the interest rate didn't rise. And Hayek would look at that and say, well, why not? And of course, the reason is it wasn't allowed to rise because the Federal Reserve was increasing the supply of credit to match the increase in demand. In fact, doing it according to the statutes that created the Federal Reserve System. It's called the Real Bills Doctrine. Uh, and so they thought it was their job to provide the funds for them to borrow. Uh, the statute doesn't say at what interest rate. Okay, but what they did willy-nilly is accommodate the demands for loanable funds at the given interest rate, at the rate that existed before you had the innovations and the technological advances and so on, okay? Uh, and of course, if you're market-oriented, you say, well, th that's going to cause an increase in demand for loanable funds. That's going to cause the interest rate to rise because of that entrepreneurial component, and that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be, okay? Uh, but they didn't change much. Okay, it didn't break through in technology, increase the demand for loanable funds, and put upward pressure on interest rates, yes, but the Federal Reserve, guided by the Real Bill Doctrine, met each increase in demand for credit with the increase in supply, thus keeping the interest rate from rising. Now, there was an occasion back in uh, the early 90s, well, early to mid 90s, where I had correspondence with Friedman because he'd written an article called The Plucking Model. I'll talk more about that uh, a little bit later in this lecture. And I wrote a comment. This is in uh, the Western Journal Economic Inquiry. I wrote a comment on the <coughs> article. And before, it was, before my comment went to press, there was some exchange between Friedman and me to see if we had a meeting of the minds. Did, we, did each of us understand the other one? And one of the first letters that uh, Friedman sent me this was back when letters were sent, not just email. <laughs> First letter had an attachment that was a plot of movements in the interest rate over the whole period of the 20s. And he considered this just, uh, you know, he'd won the argument because, look, you're trying to explain this in terms of uh, the interest rate. The interest rate didn't change during the 20s, so much for that explanation. 
And the Austrians are just sort of out of play on that one as far as he's concerned, all right? And yet, if you adopt the Hayekian research agenda, <laughs> look for forces hidden from the untrained eye, you see that they should have risen and didn't. And I ask a little question here, I think, or do I? Okay, so, so seeing no change in interest rates, Friedman dismissed interest rates as a potential independent variable in his econometric question. Uh, and this is the Austrian view. Seeing no change in the interest rate when they should have risen because of technological advances, Hayek was able to identify some critical market forces hidden from the un untrained eye. The boom in the 20s was a little more boomy than it should have been, all right? And my query here, which view of Friedman's or Hayek is a more firmly anchored in empirical, that is, historical circumstances of the 1920s? The Chicago economists are always touting their empi empiricism, how they're anchored to reality, as if the Austrian school is sort of free-floating out there, you know, above reality. Not so. It's just that the Austrians want to do a little more full-bodied history uh, to pick out uh, these kinds of uh, arguments. Okay. Friedman's view of monetary contraction. Uh, and here, you know, when, when I first introduced Friedman, it was all about inflation. Uh, Macroeconomists are, are uh, a product of their times. That was, inflation was the problem when Friedman began writing about uh, quantity theory of money. But if, in retrospect, if you apply it back to the Great Depression, then of course monetary con contraction uh, is uh, at issue here. So a sharp monetary contraction puts downward pressure on P and Q. If prices are sticky downwards, or if for some reason they don't fall, then Q will fall dramatically. Well, sure enough. And evidence shows, okay, so here's a bow before the data. Evidence shows that between October 1929 and March of 1933, decreasing M was the essential primary dominant cause of the decrease in Q. When I've heard uh, Friedman present this kind of stuff at the professional meetings, when he gets to this sort of bottom line, he, he talks like a teacher talks to students that have been kept in after school. <laughs> okay, okay, you people should see that. You know. And he goes on that way. So uh, that's the empirics. But look at what he's doing. What, he's confining the issue to the depth of the plunge uh, without any attention whatsoever of what started the plunge in the first place. What about that ordinary recession or garden variety or what, whatever you call it? Uh, so M goes down and that's going to affect Q because P is sticky. Actually, he even overplays the story if you look at the full history, as I'm, you've probably heard from Bob Higgs if, and others, that Prices were falling during that period, but the government was doing everything it could to prop them up. It was Roosevelt's programs that tried to keep prices from falling, uh, which of course made the depression much deeper uh, than it otherwise would have been. Okay, and, and uh, Mail with another monetarist, uh, Lanny Ebenstein, you know who he is. He's written a couple of different biographies of Friedman. He's the only person I know who wrote two biographies of the same person. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I wrote him this. I was trying to get the point across. Because uh, when, I, when I mentioned this garden variety stuff, he, he'd email me back and he'd say, well, it was a garden variety recession. <laughs> you need to explain why there was a recession. That's the point. You know, the economists need to explain what caused that. So, here, I, I sent him this, the case of the cabbage-eating Mississippi monster. Might not seem completely relevant to the Depression, but I'll get the point across. Uh, Austrian Chicago methodology in action. Okay, suppose that late, in late October 1929, a thousand pound monster descends on Mississippi soil. It spent the next three and a half years eating all the cabbages and quite a few rabbits between Jackson and Pascagoula, okay? By early March of 1933, the monster had weighed 4,000 pounds, okay? So two investigators are sent to Mississippi to handle the situation, one from Vienna and one from Chicago, you see. <laughs> Viennese investor, investigator asked, 
where in the world did this hideous thing come from? You know, what, what caused? And uh, here, you know, I, say, I seem to have stacked the cards against the Austrian. It's hard even to imagine an insightful answer to this question, unless, of course, the monster turns out to be an unintended consequence of some ill-conceived government sponsored bionics project, <laughs> which it could be. In fact, uh, you all watch uh, uh, sci-fi. You remember the, there was two makings of the blob, uh, early one and, and late one. One's a Keynesian blob and one's a monetarist blob. You watch both movies. The, 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 the first blob, which just came from the heavens, you know, who was the way the reality is. And the second blob in that second movie was certainly it was a misguided, ill-fated conclusion of a project carried on by the government. Okay, they call it a monitor's blob, right? So where did this thing come from? You know, that's that's the question. At least I got the question right, right? Now. The Chicago show, Chicago show shoves the Austrian aside. This is, you know, that's it. You know, enough for you off the stage. Never mind how this thing got here. The real question is, how did it grow from a thousand pounds to four thousand pounds? How did an ordinary run-of-the-mill garden variety monster <laughs> quadruple in weight in forty months? All right. Chicago's answer, which could be delivered in the tone of the teacher talking to the students after keeping him in from class, it was all those cabbages. <laughs> he couldn't get good data on the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Okay. The correlation between cabbage consumption and weight gain leaves no doubt about the issue. Okay. And of course, the question is, what's the issue? What's the issue? <laughs> Okay, you get the point. I don't need to read that. There. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes. I'm, I'm getting behind here, so I might go pretty quickly on this one. Monitor's conclusions depend on a constant or near constant velocity of money. That's the whole research program of the Chicago school during its heyday. The graduate students all measured money supply and price levels in country after country and time period after time period to show that there was very close correlation um, and that the demand for money was pretty stable. And the point of that, of course, is it means that the instability then came from the supply side uh, of the market for money, and that's the Federal Reserve. But to show that, you have to have a, you have to have a constant velocity. Uh, well, you did up to a point, okay? There's a rising price level up, up above and the money supply down below. Those things, those cold movements were pretty close up until the early to mid-80s. And then they went haywire, okay? If you just look at that series, realize they're not going to correlate very well, which means the velocity of money uh, was changing. In fact, here's Brad DeLong. Uh, velocity is supposed to be about constant. It has a slight upward trend. And this gets exaggerated just with the scale. Uh, but he shows the purple is the, the projected velocity of money given behavior before about 1982 or so. Uh, and the rest of it shows what's actually happened to velocity. It went, uh, it went wild. Velocity of money balance, money became unstable after the 1980s, okay. Friedman's policy lost its velocity anchor. Federal Reserve abandoned mon monetary policy or money stock policy and ad adopted interest rate targeting. Uh, this is what I call the irony of monetarism. The monetary rule that allows the economy to perform at its laissez faire best presupposes a critical piece of intervention, namely Regulation Q, which is what got phased out. Uh, before velocity went unstable, that makes a money supply <coughs> operationally definable. Uh, once money had lost its crisp definition, we even had Alan Greenspan testifying before the Joint Economic Committee, just sort of shrugging his so shoulders and saying, we don't know what money is anymore, okay? It was a line picked up by Jay Leno, you know, who said, he says, I don't... I really don't know what kind of a guy we want running our central bank, but surely it's somebody who knows what money is. Okay, it's got to be. And of course, what happened, I think I've got this in here somewhere, but uh, 
that Regulation Q put a very sharp distinction between deposit money on which you could not draw checks. I'm, I'm sorry, deposit money on which you, you should, could not draw interest and savings account on which you couldn't write checks. Regulation Q made a black and white distinction. And that piece of regulation is what gave the money supply, M1, a pretty crisp definition. But once that distinction was removed and you have a blurring of checking account money and saving, then uh, velocity goes haywire no matter what particular money supply you use. Implementation of monetary policy requires stable and known commercial operating ratios, commercial bank operating ratios. And here's excess reserves. Have you seen that chart? <laughs> excess reserves for years on end. Uh, well, on that graph, we're pretty close to zero. They were really, you know, 50, 60 billion or something like that uh, in reserves or less. And then starting with the financial crisis, reserves, well, it's an understatement to say they spiked. Uh, <laughs> You can see where QE2 started. You know, there's QE1, QE2. They kept pumping in more reserves. Uh, demand deposits went up some, but not nearly as much as what reserves did. In fact, we see the M1 money multiplier taking a big nosedive and then going unstable. So when you see that kind of thing going on, then you don't have a constant velocity. You don't have constant operating ratios. And there's no way you could implement a monetary rule uh, even if you want to. Now, here's one part that I think uh, I want to spend a little time on. I've got some time left. Uh, why was Milton Friedman so unreceptive to Austrian theory? Um, and it all turns on the capital theory that underlay the Chicago theorizing about business cycles. Hayek, of course, had the Austrian theory. That's the stages of production, the time element built into the notion of production. What did uh, Chicago rely on? They relied on a capital theory associated with Frank Knight. And it's one that took the time element out of the concept of capital. So there was no time element there. Uh, let's see if we can explain this. There's a uh, Hayek and Knight, they butted heads uh, in the 30s. And if we wanted to do history of thought, we could go back about 40 years and find that uh, Clark and von Bavarek butted heads on the same issue. In fact, they had the same argument. They might as well have reprinted the Clark von Bavarek articles as do the Knight uh, Hayek articles. And let's see how it works. The Clark Knight concept of capital is what I call the black box capital theory. Y'all know what black box, what's a black box? Where have you heard that term? The airlines, yeah, the airline. And is the box black? I think it's orange, I'll give, it's orange, there's one, okay. Uh, and you know it says do not open. Uh, black box has a different definition. It really comes from the field of electronics. Complex piece of equipment, typically a unit in electronic system with the contexts that are mysterious to the user, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Which just means that the, in the airlines, it just means that a subcontractor made that piece of equipment uh, and they just uh, stick it into the airplane. It's really a plug and play unit, that's all. So the airline manufacturer doesn't have to worry about what's in that black box. That's the subcontractor's job. That's what black box means. But Frank Knight and before him Clark had a black box capital theory, okay? And that's the output at the bottom and the input up at the top. And that's the capital stock. And, the, and stock, it means it exists. There it is, boom. That's capital, all right? Do not open. So you, do, you, don't, know what, you don't know what goes on in there. And it turns out that what's in there either has to be totally nonspecific, it's just a glob, or has no structure to it, or if it does have a structure, the structure is always right. And it has to be one of those, one of the two, but there's no way of knowing which it is. All right, let's see how it works. This is a steady state economy. Now, capital does wear out. Knight was aware of that. That's why we have that input up there. But the input really is just also output 
uh, of the capital stock. Some of it has to be plowed back in to keep this capital stock from shrinking. And the rest of the output is consumption. And that gets consumed, okay? That's all there is to it. And let's see if we can make it uh, work. There it is. There it is. It goes like that. So it's going uh, at a rate that keeps that capital stock from changing. Now, when you read uh, Knight's exposition, he takes that uh, maintenance of capital as part of the stock. In other words, by capital you mean the stock plus whatever it takes to maintain it as it is. So the way he would say it, the capital stock includes maintenance as a technical detail. All right? uh, and because of that, uh, the capital stock is permanent. That was a big debate between Hayek and Knight. Knight said capital was permanent. Um, Hayek called, called it the mythology of capital, referring to Knight. Okay. And both Clark, maybe especially Clark, but Clark and Knight had little qualifiers that would sort of immunize them from any criticism. Uh, and for instance, they say capital stock is permanent uh, in a sense. Okay. And a few pages later, again, they reaffirm capitalism is permanent, as it were, okay? Uh, or capitalism is permanent, so to speak, <laughs> okay? And every time you see this, you know, okay, what he means is really not permanent. You know, you have to decide to maintain. And accordingly, the permanent capital stock yields a perpetual income. Okay, well, that follows, doesn't it? And are there any qualifications there? Well, sure there are. It's, in a sense, as it were, so to speak, uh, only to the extent that capital is uh, permanent. Okay? Now, he goes a step further, and he says, uh, this might be confusing if you call it capital stock and, and consumption. You might be thinking of consumer goods, like a refrigerator or something like that. Uh, and what he really wants to do is boil it down to uh, a distinction based on dimensions. And so he says, really, it's sources that emit services. Okay, So sources is a stock and services is a flow. So there are no consumption goods. Any, any real consumption good would be one of the sources that yield a service. So a refrigerator is a source and service of cooling is the consumable output. Okay, so he takes it that far. So he's, he's he completely left or abandoned the idea of means and ends and defined that relationship strictly in terms of dimensionality. A source is a stock and the consumption is a flow. Right? So he says there's really only one factor of production is capital in the broad sense of sources. Uh, so land, labor, and capital that is a classical trilogy uh, become all capital in the broad sense. And I put an asterisk on labor because it sounds like a flow. It sounds like people working. So you might have to say the labor force or the workforce. So you have capital, you have the workforce, you have land, that's the stock, and they contribute a flow. And as long as you see that stock flow relationship, well, heck with distinguishing between land, labor, and capital, it's all just capital. It's sources and services. And I, I emphasize this because I'll show you, I think I've got time, that when Friedman thinks about the business cycle and tries to understand the Hayekian view, he thinks in terms of, guess what, sources and services. All right, let's go a little further. You can have an expanding economy. This almost belies, see so now you've got more input, like so, all right? This almost belies the notion of technological detail, but Frank Knight would realize you could even have a contracting economy. How would that work? You'd probably get in trouble there. <laughs> it's got sound effects too, but my, my, we didn't get them up. But anyhow, uh, what about production time? That's what's important with the Hayekian view. What about production time? And it goes like this. Hi, uh, Knight and Clark before him says, think of a forest. 
and we've got a bunch of trees. These are rows of trees. You can't see the trees behind this first row, but there, there are a lot of rows of trees here. And they mature. You've got a steady state is reached, and production time is irrelevant. Trees have a linear maturity structure. It's actually log linear. In each period, a sapling is set out, and a mature tree is harvested. And so there's period one, set out the sapling, harvest, the mature tree, then in period two, those grow back and you got what you had the year before. So each year you set out a sapling, each year you harvest a tree, you, and, and here's what uh, Clark and Knight say, and it is setting out the tree that enables the harvesting, it enables it, in quotes, that means as it were, so to speak, so. and setting out the tree now produces the harvestable tree now, and so they conclude that production and consumption are simultaneous. Right? So forget about period of production. Uh, you harvest and set out uh, at the same time. Here's a quote from uh, Stigler in his dissertation, 1941, which was written under, guess who, Frank Knight. Stigler defends Clark and dismisses Bon Verk on the basis of the simultaneity of, of production and consumption. Look at this. He says, we can say that any one row of trees takes 50 years to mature. He's got a different parameter there. But since there is a constant output of timber forever, there's simply no point in saying it. All right? So he's hardcore Knightian. Uh, Friedman picked up this same thing, which is kind of an incongruity. I mean, Friedman was a very good price theorist, very good microeconomist. Why would he pick up something like this in capital theory. And I think the answer is that he didn't like Hayek's theory for whatever reason. I can show you some of the reasons. Uh, and he took it on Knight's authority that we could safely ignore Hayek. And so it's not that he liked Knight's theory. He just liked Knight giving him permission to ignore Hayek. <laughs> okay. So maintenance is a technical detail versus maintenance is a matter of choice. Capital is permanent. No, capital is ever changing. Capital is the only factor. Capital is unique and heterogeneous. I could elaborate on that, but I want to go on to more different uh, points. Uh, production time is irrelevant, and production time is the key variable. The whole purpose of the Hayekian triangle is to bring production time in as an endogenous variable. It's all about sources and services. It's all about temporal capital structure. That's the contrast. And it's about steady state equilibrium, according to Clark Knight view. That's the only way that production consumption can be simultaneous. No, it's all about a dynamic market process, according to Hayek. So uh, we've got a huge contrast there. Does the interest rate play any role at all within the output aggregate for Friedman. And here is where I've got a couple of quotes that I've presented before and I've just left audiences cold. They don't understand it. But I think you will understand it now that you know about sources and services. All right. So the first part, you could follow without that. Friedman is talking about what happens when there's an increase in the money supply. But he's talking about it starting from the point where the money is already in the hands of the people. All right. Well, gee, what about it coming in through loan markets? Doesn't that lower the interest rate? Well, he overlooks that. In fact, his model is the helicopter model where the money is dropped from the helicopter and gathered up by a bunch of people. And then he's interested in, will this affect the interest rate? So here's what he says. Holders of cash will bid up the prices of assets. Uh, if the extra demand in initial is initially directed at a particular class of assets, say government securities, or commercial paper or the like, the result will be to pull the prices of such assets out of line with other assets and thus widen the area into which extra cash spills. The increased demand will spread sooner or later, affecting equities, houses, durable producer goods, durable consumer goods, and so on, though not necessarily in that order. He's fending off Hayek. This effect can be described as operating on interest rates if a more cosmopolitan, and I wrote, yeah, Austrian, uh, interpretation of interest rates is adopted than the one uh, 
which refers to a small range of marketable securities. So uh, this, this is the kind of effect he sees. But then he's dismissive of it for this reason. And I, I put the uh, Clarkian model up there, and I'm, I'm tempted to have the, the audience all read this in unison, but I won't, I won't, okay? So, so listen to what he said, this is Friedman. He says, the key feature of this process during which interest rates are low is that it tends to raise the price of sources of both producer and consumer services relative to the price of the services themselves. It therefore encourages the production of such sources and at the same time, at the same time, it's all simultaneous, the direct acquisition of the services rather than of the source, okay? But these reactions in their turn tend to raise the prices of services relative to the price of sources. <laughs> that is to undo the initial effect of the interest rate. The final result may be a rise in the expenditure in all directions without any change in interest rates at all. Uh, interest rates and asset prices may simply be the conduct through which the effect of mo monetary change is transmitted to the expenditure without being altered at all. See, because you don't have, there's no time element there. So it's, so it's all, that all happens in a, in a flash, and uh, it didn't have any real effect, okay? So I, I find that uh, revealing, and I find it even revealing that he would try to exposit that in terms of service, sources and services, okay? He's not talking about Hayek. Uh, one point I'll make before I show you the, the next screen is that uh, I was at a conference, I think it was 80, it was in the mid-80s, 86, I think, in which during a break, uh, Leland Yeager and I and Milton Friedman were discussing Dennis Robertson, who wrote some pretty turgid prose, and the discussion was how hard it was to understand what Robertson was trying to get across. And Friedman was talking about that, and then in, in mid-sentence, he interrupted himself, and he turned to me and pointing a finger at me, and he'll say, I'll tell you another book that you can't understand. He says, Hayek's Prices in Production. He says, I challenge you to read that book and tell me what's in it. Okay. So I took, <laughs> I took him for his word. And the reason that he can't understand it is because he's steeped in the Frank Knight, John Bates Clark tradition in uh, capital theory. Now, another interesting point How does Friedman account for this lag between rising M and rising P? If you don't have any time in the picture, something's got to be going on to account for that. And now, now all of a sudden, he starts sounding like Hayek. Okay? So here's what he says. How do you account for this lag? He says, well, it may be that the monetary expansion induces someone within two or three months to contemplate building a factory, within four or five to draw up plans, within six or seven to get construction started. The actual construction may take another six months, and much of the effect on the income stream may come still later, insofar as initial goods used in construction are withdrawn from inventories and only subsequently lead to increased expenditures in supply. That's very Austrian, okay? So in other words, he brings in the Austrian theory to explain the lag. And then once he's got the lag explained, there goes the Austrian theory, and he's back to Frank Knight and, and the monitors. Uh, so if you, if you look at our macro model, uh, we've got that 18-month lag that during which you have the boom and then the descent back to the PPF, and then you have the Keynesian spiraling downwards. But of course, it's only the Austrians that kind of detail what's going on during the whole path. Uh, in terms of a means-ends framework uh, and not in terms of uh, Clark Knight or in terms of Keynes. Okay, I think I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you.